Um, they may seem simple to you in concept, but think of them as your building blocks. Um, they're also kind of tools to get you in and get you started with your piece. And they're the ones that she uses in all of her quilts and um, just in different colors or scale or proportion or positioning. And so um, even though they may seem a little simple, they're... Um, they're very important in the way you think about building your quilt. So the, the four components are uh, stripes, squares, triangles, curves. And actually I had a new one with uh, working with my Australian class last week. Um, there are bits and there are slabs. And so um, they started using this terminology and uh, it's really fun, I like it. So I'm gonna start with stripes. I'm going to start with a very simple stripe. It's a very even half inch um, stripe. And notice that because it's got a white stripe and it's on a white background, it turns into a dotted line. And these are really important for creating movement. They're up, down, right, left. They're very much, your eye just wants to follow those. Now you can do the same thing and make them a little different in proportion so this is a one and a half and a half inch and um, your eye does the same thing but a little slower and then if you switch these around this one and you put the blue where the white is this turns into a series of squares and then if you actually cut this down the middle and add a stripe through it then it kind of turns into what they call beads uh, so these are lots of fun and think about them this way when you start connecting them in different ways they create secondary patterns and the reality is you could take these three stripes in two colors and make a million quilts for the rest of your life and never repeat one um kind of like mondrian did with his um primary colors black and white and his rectangles and squares so if you do not use one of the colors as your background, then you kind of get a stripe stripe. Now, this is a very bold graphic stripe. Um, it reads as nautical. Your eyes will go through it if it's in your quilt. So this is everybody's favorite. It's really wonky and it's your most labor intensive. And basically on this one, it was an orange, a blue, and an orange stripe. And then um, kind of like this is a red, black, red. And then you cut them across horizontally. And then you add a strip of the other color in between. And then you sew these together without paying any attention to how they line up. And you get this kind of this great wonky moving uh, strip. And the other thing you can do, you can take a stripe like this, with lots of different colors. Now, you take this, which is the same stripe as this, and on this one I put blue on either side, and so you kind of get this ladder effect with this embedded in it. And then on this one, I put white on either side, and so you get an entirely different effect. So you have the colored lines kind of floating in this white background. So that's a lot of fun to play with as well. Um, last but not least, I'm going to go through skinny lines. And so here's a skinny line. Now the way you make a skinny line is to put, and this is a 5 8 inch red and a two and a half inch blue and I sewed them together and then when you sew them you want to press away from your skinny line and this is in your tips as well so take this apart and take this to the iron and make sure you um, press your seam allowance away from where your skinny line is because then when you sew it onto your piece you sew from this side so you can see exactly how wide you're making your skinny line. And you can make them as tiny as a sixteenth of an inch. You can make them a hairline if you, if you want to. 
Um, but that's the trick to doing that, and it's in your, your tip packet as well. Um, and then we have just random... This is, um, to me, it looks like taffy from when we were children. Um, it's, it's just a symmetric uh, stripe. And on this one, I just kind of took the, the pink and the blue and the orange, and I sewed them together so that they created this divided checkerboard. And the last one, which I don't really like much, but feel free, um, I actually made my stripe and then I cut diagonals through it and sewed, sewed different colors. And you could actually put this together in different ways so you could create V's or herring bones or that kind of thing. So stripes are really versatile, really handy tools, use them a lot. And um, let's go on to squares. So squares the easiest one is checkerboards and um, this is a very graphic checkerboard um, you put it in one of your pieces and it's going to be very visual people's eyes are going to be drawn to it because they love checkerboards and it's an even pattern i like to make little tiny ones and put them every once in a while in quilts and that way um, they kind of create um, action points your eyes will bounce between them if you do them in black and white they really make your colors pop which is interesting. Um, another square is log cabins. This is just a wonky log cabin, but I, it's, it's fun to see how you can change your appearance of a log cabin just by changing your color arrangement and the size of your rounds. And so this one here kind of looks like a window to me in the middle of this one with the white and this one with the white skinny line outside of your dark really kind of emphasizes the uh, squareness of that and it kind of pulls your eye into the center. Now let me just warn you against this kind of check of a uh, log cabin. So anytime you have high contrast and even rounds, whether it's a circle or a triangle or a square or a trapezoid it's going to read as a target and your eyes are going to go directly to that so you can make a whole quilt put one of these in and you might as well have not have made the quilt because this is all anybody's going to see so you can use them I've seen some gorgeous quilts that are all of these and I've seen gorgeous quilts with several in them but be sure and just know that they do that and use them wisely okay now of course um i use a lot of these which are skinny line log cabins so the trick of making skinny line log cabins is the same as your skinny lines so make sure when you're doing your skinny lines that you press those away from the seam allowance so you can see how wide your lines are going to be I don't, can't tell you how many times I go over, I press it up to go back, and I line up the next one, and I go, oh my gosh, I didn't do that right, and I can't see where I'm sewing, and so then I have to go back and press it again. So, just something to keep in mind. Now, I love to put them on stems. They can go up like this for flowers. You can hang them down for pendulums. You can make ears out of them. And all you do to put a stem in is to make sure you put a line or two or three through your last round in the background and this is a very simple one it's a little bit bigger you know wider and um, same thing just with one round and then we have something that is um, I'm stealing from uh, Maria Shell I didn't use to put this in this lecture, but a lot of my students have taken from Maria Shell, and so they were bringing them into their pieces, and so I thought I, I, I might as well include them. Um, she calls them dots. I don't think they're dots because they're square, but that's, that's her. She calls them dots. She uses them quite well. Um, just be aware that this in most places is going to read as an office building or an apartment building it's going to turn your quilt into a cityscape unless you're really careful so be careful how you use this as well 
Another thing I must say I've, I've stolen from Maria Shell that I do use quite a bit are, um, she, this is a plaid, but with only two colors. So basically it's a bunch of skinny lines that were cut into pieces and sewn back together and then cut through again and sewn back together. I think in two colors like this, it kind of looks like alligator skin, um, tree bark, but it's a different kind of square and it's wonky and it's fun to use. So those are the main squares that I use. And we're gonna move on to triangles. I hate triangles. I'll just tell you that right off the bat. Triangles and I don't get along. It's kind of like me and horses. They try to kill me every time I get on one. Uh, triangles like to come out with no points, no matter how I use them or how I make them. Um, but I've gotten more and more attached to triangles. I'm using them more than I used to. and so one thing you can do concentric triangles when you're using triangles remember you're working with bias and that also you need to make everything twice as big as you think you need to make it because just taking a piece like this where i cut a gray square and then i surrounded it this brown piece has to be long enough to be able to be pressed open and sliced into making your point so you can't just go and go i'm going to do one that's here to here because when you open it up then you're not going to have this point on the end so the other thing is do not ever trim these at your sewing machine take them to your iron press them open then trim them another thing to think about with triangles is they read as mountains or they can read as trees, depending on how you arrange them. In this direction, um, you turn them this direction, put them on a post, they are a flag, a pennant, pretty much every time. If you put it on a skinny line out this way, of course, it's an arrow. So, just be aware, you can make arrows, a lot of people, uh, make beautiful arrows and they use them to be arrows but just know that that's what you're making now this is an isosceles triangle and basically i just cut um three by four inch rectangles of black and white layered them on top of each other cut from the center down to the corners you have a handout on this and these are fun to play with because there's this configuration, and you notice how the points all are just wonky. They just kind of run together. That's a very interesting thing. Um, where these little white spots are is a really fun little place for your eye to hit and then move on, and so it creates interest. If you arrange them in a different way, you can make this beautiful Charlie Brown shirt. If you arrange them... In a different way you can make nice big bold diamonds and then if you arrange them this way you can actually create this like this mid-century modern where you have the um, it's a skinny outline around your diamond and so just from this simple little pattern here you can do all these different arrangements which I think is so much fun and then I'm sure you um, oh here's a different so this one is in different colors so notice with the different colors how they make uh, secondary patterns as well and so like this is a special pattern here um, that you can use all the way across that when you have a bunch of those in a row your eye will be will be drawn to those but there's different patterns that are involved there and depending on how many colors you use you can you know really play with those and then we have everybody's favorite, um, half square triangles. Ta -da! You probably never use these, I'm sure. You probably know how to make ones with, make eight out of one or two pieces of fabric. Um, I used to really hate them, but I was playing with them for the Curated Quilts Magazine uh, Challenge, and I really got involved and enjoy them. And now I've been using them quite a bit in my quilts. Um, they also make really fun secondary patterns. Um, 
This is just in your two colors. But you can really start playing with, you know, how these are arranged and how you want to set them up and what kind of patterns they'll make. And this is like, and what I did for the one I did for curated quilts is I did a bunch of them. And then I came back and I cut through them and put red skinny lines in the middle of them. And they were really, really lots of fun to play with. So you should, you should play with those sometimes. You probably already have. I'm slow to the game of past square triangles. And then last but not least, my very favorite way to make triangles is to use skinny lines. And so basically this started as a piece of brown fabric that was four inches by 10 inches and I just cut my diagonals through it. And then I took a, about an inch wide piece of gray and just started at one end and just inserted them as I went. I, you know, pressed away from the seam allowance so I knew how wide I was making my lines so I could make them wonky. And then when I did that, after I did that, then I slit through them and added another stripe of gray. And I've been known to do that three or four times to make these really fun little patterns that are kind of jaggedy, wiggly, you know, lightning type and um, really add a nice little touch here and there in a quilt. So that's triangles. And now we move to curves. Now I use a lot of curves and I use a lot of curves in a lot of different ways. So basically what the way I do my curves, I put two pieces of fabric on top of each other and then I slice through both of them at the same time. Now if you want a really particular curve, feel free to draw it first. If you want it to be a real circle or a real particular oval, you you know, feel free to use a compass or whatever tools you've got. Um, you kind of get used to making them and you start trusting yourself. Um, one thing you can do when you're doing them at first and you're not sure exactly whether you want to hit that fabric yet, do like, you know, when they put the, the golf ball and they try it about 300 times and then they hit it. It's kind of the same thing. Get your muscle memory going and then slice through it. This seems to be the angle that I tend to cut circles with my arm. Now you notice there is no seam allowance. So the way I do mine is I cut, I put the different colors together. I start in the center by lining up the center, kind of eyeballing it. And then I pin about every inch going in one direction. And then I pin going the other direction. Now some people use glue. Some people have, you know, don't use pins at all. A lot of people like to use where when you're sewing it, you just keep lining up your edge. But I don't know about me, but when I start doing that, then I tend to distort my curve. And, um, and it straightens out too much because we do have bias edges here. So you have to be careful, and obviously I'm not careful enough. But the other thing is when I sit down at my sewing machine to, to pin these, that's kind of like rest time. I can sit there, I can pin it, then I sew it real fast. And then they open up beautifully. I would make sure you use a scant quarter seam allowance on these because you just don't want anything wider than that. You can get thinner than that, but not wider. And then when you take it over, it opens up and it's absolutely beautiful, except your ends will not line up. So just know that before you start. Because there's no seam allowance, it's not going to come out even. So when you trim... I trim to the square side of the arc of the pie. And the other thing you want to think about is, um, oh gosh, where was I going with this? I forgot already. It'll come to me. So, I do a lot of quarter circles. I use them in a lot of different ways. I put them together to make um, little bumps. The other thing that I use a lot are the other parts of these. So if I'm just using these, then I've got these left over. These are beautiful little pieces to make transitions. 
So if I've got a right angle in a quilt, here, let me make, let me make a right angle in a quilt for you. So I've got this, you can be over there, and then I've got this guy coming up here. So I've got this, this severe angle here, and I want to soften it a little bit. I can throw in one of these, and you can do them, I thought I had a tiny one here, I don't seem to. Um, you can even just do little tiny pieces of them, and it softens that curve there. So the other thing I use these a lot for is to open up new spaces. So I've been working here in the middle. I've got this the way I want it, but I have, I don't know where to go next. A lot of times I will throw in something like this on an edge at the bottom, at the top, and it gives me a new location out here to start working with new pieces. So they're really quite handy. Um, now, I also do half circles. And I do half circles the same way I do quarter circles. I start in the middle, I pin them, I sew them, press them open, trim them across here. Now this is another thing to watch for when you're making your quilt because this is a bridge pretty much every time you use it. So between this and the dots you can make a, and the triangles, you can make a beautiful landscape. Now if you take this, let's do this one, and you put a half circle on top of a rectangle or a square, you're going to end up as with a building, either a dome, uh, a domed cathedral or a mosque or something like that. Something to think about. If this was a triangle on top, it would be a house. Can't help it. It's always going to be a house when you put a triangle on top of a square. So play with those. Um, the, another thing I do quite often is I cut through them. So I've got this one. It's white and black. And I will slice through it. I will stitch it first, this curve, and then I will play with pieces to go through it. Now, of course, when you do something like this, you put a white in it, it disappears in the white, and it only shows up in the black. Or you can do it the other way around, and you can put it through so it only shows up in the white. Or you... Or you make these that are half, and you can kind of arrange them any way you want to. So I can make teeth coming in, white teeth coming in and going through. I can make cogs going in. I can make extensions going out. It doesn't want to play. So I use these a lot to create different kinds of things and interest. And the other thing you can do with curves, you can also make skinny lines in your curve. Now, you're not going to make a bias strip and embed it. You're not going to use a, stripe, a straight. What you're going to do is cut, cut your two pieces, and then you're going to sew the opposite color on top you're going to trim it, you're going to press it away from your skinny line, and then you're going to put the other piece of the brown, and you're going to sew eh, this to this, and you have an embedded skinny line, and you can do that as many times as you want. You can make an entire target like that, so you just keep going out. And here's a piece that has a lot of these things in it. So basically this is a curve. I've embedded uh, three lines in it. The other thing I want to point out on this one is on this skinny stripe here that is several pieces of fabric, these want to come apart on you because they're so thin. They have so few stitches holding them together. So be sure and stay stitch these. 
And that way, all you know, every time you sew it, that all your seam allowances will be going the same way. They'll lie flat. You don't have to worry about them anymore. It takes a minute, but it's worth it in the long run. Now, the other thing to notice on this is that when I sewed these back together, I get this beautiful jagged curve. Now, I don't care about that. If you do care about the way to not do that is when you start sewing those back together, like sewing this piece to this piece, do a parallel pinning. Um, so you're basically pinning exactly where you're going to sew. Open it up. See if you like how that curve sits. And if so, go ahead and sew it. If not, just start scooching it back and forth until you get that curve like you want it. And then another thing I discovered not too long ago, because I'm not real bright, is I have this piece done. It's in the middle of my quilt. I don't want to change the size, the scale. It's acting quite nicely. But somehow I decided I need this in it. So I want to embed this, but I don't want to hurt this one too much. So what I've figured out is if you offset your circle by about a quarter inch, and then I'm going to cut the brown out and then pin this circle in and sew it. I have basically created seam allowance in there. And that seam allowance will allow this half circle to sit into this brown field perfectly. And you can do that on the corners as well, like I wanted to make this a ah, not an ah. I wanted to kind of cut the corner off of this with this arc. I would do the same thing. I would basically offset it by a quarter inch in both directions, then cut my brown, and then sew this in, and it fits perfectly. So, those are the four main components that I use in my quilts in different, different ways. And after working with Australia last week, we have my new thing, which they call uh, bits. And bits, of course, are these little pieces of fabric that are all over the floor and your cutting table and your bin. And um, we all have them around, and I use these a lot. Whereas a slab is going to be kind of a big piece of fabric, and it can be really big. Um, a lot of times you need big pieces of fabric thrown in without anything as a place for your eye to go rest. So... And I've seen a lot of students now get to the point where they're not sure what to do. They've made a million components, but they're not working for them. And a lot of times it's just separating them out, throw a big piece of fabric on, and then start working again into it. And it's fun to play with these in a different sort of way. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to put this little here. Now I will layer things on top. So my little bits now you know i can play with on top of these and so just by adding four little bits i've completely kind of changed what this looks like now what you're going to do is embed these which means you're going to have to make this into a stripe actually cut through your slab and then sew it back in um, i have instructions for that in handouts as well and so this is basically the way I start my quilt. I will pick up something. It depends on the day, how I feel. Um, I may have an intent. I may not. I know I had a whole bunch of dancing quilts that the intent was to create movement. And um, so that's where I started. And then I did the entire um, drawing. I decided I wanted to see if I could make drawings in fabric. And so I did my skinny line drawing quilts. Um, these days, I have gone down the floral rabbit hole. I don't know why, but they're just calling to my name right now, so I'm playing with those a lot. So, 